You just got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It sucks. I come from like a Gnostic philosophical background and that can be seen from a fairly dark lens or it could be seen from a fairly liberating lens. And I've fluctuated over the years. The crazy, fantastic experience I had maybe about three or four years ago at this point was my last ride for a while. So I haven't talked to the elves about what they think about AI. I'm scared of that. But absolute reverence for the space is really friggin' important because it is the mystery. And I had to sit with a deep discomfort about my experience because it was so reality shattering because it was so vivid. Even the most starchy of us can still have our ass handed to us because the rabbit hole is that deep. There's never a point where people are going to just be like, yeah, I'm comfortable with the mystery. Well, then you're not going deep enough. Greetings, future fossils, and welcome to episode 229 of the podcast that explores our place in time. I'm your host, Michael Garfield. This week, we are speaking with my dear friend, Sarah Finn Huntley, about her work as art director for a book coming out in a few months at Inner Traditions by David J. Brown, The Field Guide to DMT Entities which is a project I have been dreaming about and eager to see someone manifest now for well on 20 years. I think this kind of effort to catalog the strange phenomena that occur in quote unquote non-ordinary states of consciousness is a necessary precursor to more formal and rigorous work as people who listen to the show regularly have heard me say many times my great inspiration william Irwin thompson said that novelty emerges into culture first through the crazies then the artists then the savants and then the pedants so we are in stage two of this process and moving incrementally into stage three with projects like the proposed extended state DMT research at NOAA Nautics, where Sarah and I both sit on the board of advisors. It's a very exciting, weird, interesting conversation uh, that I hope you enjoy listening to as much as I enjoyed participating in. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that Future Fossils is entirely listener supported and about to go through a major rebrand as I pursue the issue of agency in the age of automation and how to live a meaningful life inside the information scaling avalanche of the uh, AI revolution. Humans on the Loop is now thankfully a fiscally supported project through happyhappi.org and can accept tax deductible donations. So I'm no longer selling paintings. I am giving them away as gifts to large supporters. If you are interested in that, you wanna book me for consulting, any of that kind of stuff to support the new Space Monkey initiative that I am deep in the mix with and about which I am providing updates. Now, in a, a new essay I just published to Substack and Patreon, please let me know. Uh, the new essay, Refactoring Freedom and Autonomy for the Age of Language Models, is up in response to the prompt issued by Humans on the Loop supporters, Cosmos Institute. Highly recommend that. And I just bagged the 17th conversation for this podcast series with O'Shaughnessy Ventures founder and Maverick lead Jim O'Shaughnessy. Exciting news on all fronts. I hope all of you are doing well and I wish you the best through a season of tumult and surprising disturbances. So support the show by liking and subscribing, obviously by reviewing this on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, by becoming a monthly supporter, a Patreon or Substack, etc., etc. And now, thank you 
for listening to the latest in a series of excellent conversations with Sarah Finn Huntley, psychonaut, multimedia artist, soul sister, amazing human being. Thanks and enjoy. Sarah, welcome back. Yeah, hey. thanks for having me back. <laughs> Good to be here. So in proper Future Fossils time-honored tradition, this is a retake of a marvelous conversation I had with you and David J. Brown about the book that you're putting out together that suffered mysterious machine elf related technical glitch errors. And we had to light some incense and scare the gremlins out of the manifold of our recording. And now we're doing this again. So thanks for your commitment to the cause, which actually is probably the right place to start this if we can just talk about your back history, your autobiography as a psychonaut. I'd love to talk about the inception of this book, but also the work that you've done with uh, Diana Reed Slattery and Xenolinguistics, which I think will figure heavily into the questions I have for you. So thanks. Yeah, I feel like I got a pretty early start with psychedelic exploration in general. I grew up in the suburbs of California and I got started as a teenager, to be quite frank. And I don't know, I was a, a really curious kid. I was really into like mythology and like philosophy and just like existential stuff. And so that seemed like a natural like growth from those interests. And I became fascinated with DMT pretty early on too. I had a friend who was in a band who had Rick Strassman's book. I must have been maybe only 19 or 20. And I was stoked. I was like, this looks like a whole crazy adventure because I was familiar with mushrooms and a few of the other plant teachers, but, you know, like smoking weed and things like that. But DMT was like a whole new realm. I had no idea that psychedelics could take you to another place. And so immediately, like, there was this really deep fascination, but also like a reverence. So I, did my research on it, but at the same time was willing to wait. So it was maybe like a year or two later that I finally got the chance to experience it. And it just became like a, a lifelong interest in like intellectual way, but then also just personally in my art, just trying to create like a personal cartography and understand what these weird dimensional experiences were. And in general, I, I took the path as a, a visionary artist and explored a lot of different mediums over the years and worked on various projects and was part of the underground music scene on the West Coast for a long time, doing a lot of weird like projection performance art stuff, trying to sort of cargo cult the DMT elves. And so it found its way into a bunch of different mediums in my art. And yeah, working with Diana, I had a feature in her book about xenolinguistics. That was really amazing. It's just like the whole ensemble of people and minds that she brought together. But that was awesome. But just also just like everybody's different, unique perspective and approach to the xenolinguistics. Because as we know, like charting the territory is so subjective that there's a lot of different kind of almost like families of languages and ways that people interpret the light languages. Yeah, so so here we are with like this book coming out in February next year. It's been a wild ride and like leveraging AI to make that happen just because it's such a dense space that it would be overwhelming. It'd take a lifetime to paint that many entities for a publication in a short time because you got to produce a book. So David and I came up with this idea, gosh, I was a 10 years ago, like 10 or 11 years ago, we had been inspired by the golden book guide, the little field guides to different things like mushrooms and plants. And we were like, wouldn't it be awesome if one day there was a guide to the DMT entities that was the same way? And it, of course, that's wildly ambitious. But as technology got more wild and just unpredictable, the the advances in the AI imagery just in the year leading up to us deciding to make the book. So yeah, it's been a wild ride. So before we get into the whole field guide dimension of this, I want to, you brought up the term light language, and I just want to press a little more on 
the phenomenology of DMT as including not just entities, but linguistic structures and entities that are linguistic structures and linguistic structures that create entities and this whole nexus that seems to be disclosed through these experiences between a, a profound and mysterious relationship between language and being that it seems linked to the revelations disclosed by various esoteric traditions. Terrence McKenna used to go on all the time about the logos and speaking the world into being. And obviously, like right now, it's folded into the process of this book itself by using generative AI to highly compress the amount of time in which it takes to render all of this stuff. So yeah, I would love to hear you just riff on the nature of language and how you feel that relates to this project. And I, I, in a minute, I, I got to go dig up K. A lot of McDowell's Pharmaco AI, the book they co-authored with GPT-3, because there's a section in the intro to that book I feel is really pertinent to this conversation. But I'll do that while you're riffing here. Awesome. Yeah, so initially, the process, I came to it thinking that it's going to be this collaborative kind of workflow with the AI and discovering the ways to talk to it to get the results that I'm looking for. And thinking of it just as this kind of language lump of clay. And if I learn the ways the model is oriented when I describe things, then I could better navigate what its imagination is. These are just metaphors, of course, right? Like it's a limited language model. Citing with like images and machine learning, it's not, doesn't actually have an imagination. But you do intuitively start to understand the ways in which it's going to interpret certain words that you pick, um, especially really artistic or aesthetically esoteric language that's talking about genre features of like obscure visionary art. I'm talking to it about hyperdimensional geometries and I'm talking to it about nanotechnology or I'm talking to it about different aspects of like fantasy aesthetics or different things, trying to find this nice aggregate to all of the reports and things that people have talked about when they witness a specific phenomenon that they have attached this word to. So it says, oh, I saw this blue person. And then describe their experience with that. Like I could be like, oh, that's a humanoid. Okay. It's got this spectral color quality to it. But then there's all these other layers of context that vary from report to report. And so in a way, I'm curating the, the different qualities that are going to be eventually visually represented and giving them this little archetypal ambassadorship. But what I found really interesting is that, and of course, you can cut all these categories with as fine or broad measures you want. I've seen some commentators in the psychedelic space give it about 12 different representations of archetypes. And that was pretty expansive. They, it covered all the bases. It's really interesting. I think we have close to 24 or something in the book. But there's this interesting thing where they become almost like a spectrum and they, they bleed over and it really becomes contextual. Like when I hear someone talk about the machine elves versus the jesters, my brain has much less distinction between those things because there is a quality to... The, the subjective pattern matching that everybody does when they're given raw data of this very alien, yet somehow familiar DMT experience. And whether it's a humanoid that comes out that's got like these multi-armed fractals that they might think is like an Indian goddess or something like that, or maybe it has some kind of geometric protrusion from its head. And so maybe they think, oh, it looks like a jester hat. So we assign these different linguistic tags, because that's how our mind works or frames things, to these raw data moments, but then it's also colored by the raw human emotional impact of, are these gestures making fun of me? Is this an Indian goddess who wants to just like, envelop me in her like a billion arms of like, compassion? So there, and there's even darker still visions that people have. And so it's like, how do we reconcile these different qualities? This, what might look nefarious, scary to one person, might just be a little mischievous or weird 
Kurt Dooney, someone else. But yeah, that's what I think about language. And I think that's the main takeaway I had with how it impacted my understanding of um, just how human beings, at, at the end of the day, when we come back from these ineffable experiences, we have to try to crunch it into little mouth sounds and little paper scribbles and stuff. Yeah, but seeing how a machine tries to learn what we mean by these things is strange. And I think it's re- it's going to be more relevant and interesting going into the near future with brain models, brain data, and stuff like that. Yeah, I definitely want to get to that before our time is up today. But this question of language as the compression of or like the decontextualization for the purpose of intersubjective agreement of this larger, unfathomably rich, continuous existence is something that crops up again and again. And we can choose our own adventure here. Certainly one of the things I wanted to talk about was the spirit of this project. And you and David spend a lot of time talking about prior art, as it were, and the various people that have done this kind of work in the past, the lineage in which you stand, which I think is a really important call to raise when you're talking about work that is inherently challenging to the kind of modern binary construction of self and other anyway, right? Like I've been thinking a lot about what it means to reformat our idea of intellectual property, given the fact that we live online and we're thinking about endosymbiosis and our place in the human social superorganism and the nature of informational inheritance, which seems to be something that tryptamine experiences are constantly drawing our attention into anyway. So yeah, I wanted to just real quickly read this passage from Aldous Huxley's essay, Heaven and Hell, that I love because I think it, I, it scopes out your project here. He says, like the earth of a hundred years ago, our mind still has its darkest Africa as its unmapped Borneos and Amazonian basins. In relation to the fauna of these regions, we are not yet zoologists. We are mere naturalists and collectors of specimen. This fact is unfortunate, but we have to accept it. We have to make the best of it. However lowly, the work of the collector must be done before we can proceed to the higher scientific tasks of classification, analysis, experiment, and theory making. And then Huxley goes on to basically say, this stuff is as strange as the platypus was to the British Royal Society when they first brought back specimens from Australia, but that if you go to the antipodes of the conscious mind, you will encounter all sorts of creatures at least as odd as kangaroos. You do not invent these creatures any more than you invent marsupials. They live their own lives in complete independence. A man cannot control them. All he can do is go to the mental equivalent of Australia and look around him. Okay, this issue of independence is something I want to dig into with you at some length, because again, okay, so Alato McDowell in Pharmaco AI, kind of a sister volume, as far as I'm concerned to y'all's book, in an exchange with GPT-3 says, if there is no outside, that is, if the recognition of increasingly higher order patterns by intelligence is merely the reshuffling of a bounded complexity, if it happens within a local minima, then it will be fair to say that, for example, a neural net model without self-reflection is an artist inasmuch as the model is able to perform a convincing but not truly novel remixing of patterns. However, if we require from art a real generativity that reflects emergent or novel hyperspaces, then artists will necessarily be channels, portals to an outside. As artists perceive and transmit emergent hyperspace, they interface with an outside. This is the Australia of the mind that Huxley is talking about. And yet, last little piece I want to stack on this, and invite your reflections. David quotes James Kent in Alien Information Theory, saying that James uh, tried to prove the independent existence of DMT entities by asking them for information that he wouldn't have, and said, like a dream, once you realize you're dreaming, you're actually slipping into wakefulness and the dream fades. So it is with the elves as well. 
when you try to shine a light of reason on them, they dissolve like shadows. So it's there, there seems to be something about where people fall from the kind of hyperbolic geometry that Andres Gomez Emelson and the folks at Qualia Research are focused on, the higher logical order of these experiences and the relatively unmediated phenomenology of them. And then we come back down into our normal lives and the categorical abstractions that serve us in this era of human history. And we're stuck trying to bin this stuff as either it is independent from me or it's not. And so I'm really curious, given your history of psychonautics and all of the research you've done on this particular bouquet of phenomena, what you feel is really going on here as far as the ontological shock induced by encountering these, what are often perceived as alien creatures and what you think that might have to say more about us and the philosophical framework that we're bringing to these experiences. Is that? Yeah, yeah. 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 We're in meat space. Yeah. If we're going to take our, our the perceptions that we've been handed down, like, you know, being conscious as this, like, species or whatever, that we're going to take these perceptions with us, be like, okay, we're made of meat. We live on a terrestrial surface of the swarm singing, sorry, slider, there's and swarm in space. Okay. And like, we still have dreams and mystical experiences and eat weird plants. And sometimes there are crazy people who have weird experiences that we can't explain. And you look at like how delirious Datura can be, like whole other weird places. And you just look at the just stack of all of these different catalysts and how far they send you, right? These different levels. I personally, I, I respect James Kent and I understand what he's saying, but at the same time, I think that like his understanding of what knowledge is limited by his own set. Okay, for me personally, many years ago, I uh, did TCB one of the first times in my early 20s or whatever, and I was listening to some fabulous drum and bass. I had my eyes closed and I could see this geometry in my mind's eye and I drew it. And it turned out to be this crystallographic code like PM, whatever. But I held on to that little nugget. I was like, this is significant. This is cool. This is like an actual mathematical artifact that I was able to bring back from that space. And in the same session, there was like some interesting other mystic stuff. I draw the back of the page and there was this translucent quality, multi-dimensionally that go through the page. But like, I held on to this little artifact and taking classes with Ralph Abraham at UCSC, I remember bringing it to him after class and being like, which wallpaper group is this? Will you help me figure it out? Because that's what we were learning about in his class. And he helped me see it classify it. And I was like, I saw this on T-Suite. That's Shulgin compound. And he was just like, Daisy. But for me, I was like, this is a piece of math that I would have never really come up with on my own. And just from some random close eye visual or hallucination or a synesthetic thing. I, I have aphantasia, so there's no just random math floating around in my post. But there have been many such interesting moments picking apart the form constant of, I don't know if you, the, you know what I mean, like the neurological framework for which a lot of the hallucinations, their uh, lattice work and spider webs and spirally mandalas, all of those motifs and their neurological yeah. underpinnings. I think that in and of itself is knowledge and evidence and things outside of our own normal native default perception of ourselves and our perception of our perception. I think that meta awareness is a big deal, especially when you go into even crazier territory with like TLs and you get the overwhelmingly people do sense this other. And then it's a matter of, okay, how much am I culturally projecting on it? How much am I pattern projecting on it? Because I think those are two related, but somewhat separate things. But there is just so much going on in that space that it's entirely beyond our ability to imagine. But how much of that is artifacts of neurological phenomenology stuff? How much of that is potentially... I'm going to get whimsical. I do a lot of thought experiments. I'm not saying that they're real, but they're important to think about the thought experiments. 
Sometimes I wonder if psychedelics are different ways of pushing and pulling this simulation, this reconstruction that Huxley's talking about when he talks about language as a sieve. When he talks about like our meat suit as this straining thing that's bound by what's going to keep us alive on the planet. Because th- there's just so many dimensional limiters that get pulled out, it seems like, when people trip loss, that there's got to be things that you can see from just the consistency and the novelty of the space. It's very hard to tease apart what is you know, like metaphorically, you'd be like, what's hardware? What's software? Like, what's the meat puppet? What's the chemical? What's like actual physics? Like, what's the nature of energy or whatever? Because I've had plenty of weird experiences that make me think that bioenergy doesn't really play by the rules that we've been telling ourselves for the past couple hundred years or whatever. Whether it's like Reiki energy or prana or whatever, this animus energy. There's just so many things that are given or granted that I I don't think it does justice to the field or makes any sense to just be close-minded and be like, oh, it's not real. But I'm not going to like just say, oh, we got down the elves are totally real, dude. I've been there. Yeah. To the extent that there's that whole Roland Fisher hallucination perception continuum and you know, we have to start from a place. If once your mind is blown, you have to start from a place of epistemic humility, which is you might as well be like the future fossils motto: epistemic humility. the The thing that occurs to me is I think about there was a book, Varela Vermesh and Deprez on becoming aware that I read in school, and they talk about how you start from the in phenomenologically you start from the in like an intuitive ap- apprehension of something or like the appearance and then you confirm it intersubjectively and then you reach beyond the intersubjective cultural confines and confirm it in a more objective third person way and that this process really doesn't have any kind of prescribed endpoint that what you're doing when you talk about identifying something as real is you are constantly pressing beyond the assumed or like invisible priors that the experiential limits that you share and you were just talking about that about the way that the the interaction with these compounds strips the filters through which we see things i think a lot about the children who see ghosts when i was thinking about what in astrobiology they call agnostic biosignature detection at the diverse intelligences summer institute a few years ago when i painted that piece that ended up in this book the one with the machine elves and the cephalopod and all that stuff there were papers i pulled out on how there are specific classes of visual phenomena that are only apparent to children under the age of six months and then you can see this in in, in empirical studies that after a while, their brainstem just starts filtering this stuff out. And that's precisely the kind of stuff that there's a huge body of literature on kids th- three, four years and younger who report perceiving things that none of the adults around them can perceive and, and remembering things that none of the adults around them can remember. So, okay, that having been said, there is this other thing which you spoke to a moment ago, which is the way that different people perceive something that might be described in a similar way, but react to it differently, or it seems like a crapshoot. When you go into these spaces, what kind of experience you're going to have. And so this is like a real intensification of the, the whole like principle of set and setting and the acceptance that, you know, like Richard Doyle talks about in the beginning of Darwin's pharmacy, how there's this trope in the Arrowhead Trip Report literature of the mistake, which is that because these compounds are inherently mind expanding, there's always something you didn't plan or predict going into them, which is exactly the same as what you were talking about with interacting with this enormous latent space in language models. That there's like hallucination is inevitable in language models for the same reason that you can't really 
reliably will yourself to see the blue lady or mantids or whatever. And it's, you're just going to end up with this thing. So I'm curious to the extent that this is articulated with the question of the ontological status of these entities. I'd like to hear you talk about how the work of creating a taxonomy of DMT entities might also be considered the work of mapping hyperspace itself. Like it's a cartography project of the uncontrollable variables of someone's own like address within this enormous uh, manifold. And it's like, why is it that certain people do in fact consistently perceive specific, and like Chris Bledsoe, famously, his entire family has interacted with <laughs> these, these sort of angelic, whatever they are in mm-hmm. normal, what quote unquote waking state, whatever the internal DMT correlate might be. Stuart Davis and his family and his longitudinal relationship with mantis beings. And there are these Stuart's show Aliens and Artists. While that was running, he was really prosecuting this question of why it is that these kinds of encounters that are happening spontaneously rather than through DMT induction seem to be associated with genetic lineage. So there is this sort of as within, so without quality to it that suggests that the kind of things we're encountering maybe say more about us than they do about, or like us in the the bigger sense. And I'd like to hear you riff on that. I feel like there's a lot that can be said about this because there's definitely we can't with people who think that DMT entities are just DMT phenomena. And then there's the camp of people who see that there is at least subjectively a relationship between the kinds of beings that people see and beings that people have seen in their states of consciousness completely aside from the DMT or ayahuasca cultures. And they can range from gray aliens to mantids to angelic beings to bodiless uh, beings of light, all kinds of stuff. And there's such a rich research out there in terms of the internet and even before that in the UFO community and the alien abduction community. And that material is actually respected and touched on in our book because it, there is so much weird hallmark overlap. People say, oh, I got abducted by mantid aliens. That that does shift the conversation for people who are willing to see that connection between the archetypes that people are saying. And it couldn't say more about us. But at the same time, it's also, you know, seems to transcend culture. There are reptilian things in many cultures. There are little tiny fairy people in many cultures. But Hune and Hawaii, you've got leprechauns in Ireland. You've got little people in ancient Javanese stuff. Just, there's little people in all kinds of mysteries, also giants. And it, that gets into other weird parts of conversation in human history that people make in hypothesis, like, where do we even come from? What does it mean when we talk about our genetic lineage and, and evolution as a set? We'll go out, set, set out spaces. And the subtext of that is ancient aliens, just for people who didn't get that implication. But I will say, what I find interesting is the intergenerational thing or the genetic lineage thing, because I've seen it in some of the examples you're talking about with families who encounter these things, whether it's like alien abductions and stuff or other kinds of paranormal phenomenon. Like me and my dad and my brother saw this ball lightning looking thing. It didn't behave like ball lightning. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't really just write it off as that. But um, it, that was an experience I was so small. I must have been like four and my brother must have been like three. And I thought it was a dream. I wrote it off. And my brother remembers it very vividly. But when I brought it up as a teenager to a friend, my dad was around. He overheard that and he went ghost white because he remembered the whole event as well. He was like, that wasn't a dream. And so for me, there's was like, there might be rare occurrences, but there are moments where physics just breaks and you have someone there that's confirming it from across the abyss, so to say, but you're both in mid-space. You're not both high. 
And so there's just too many experiences that people have had to just write them all off or be like, oh, everybody's kids. But I think in terms of going back to talking about what the spirit of the book is, and I don't mean this in a trivial way, it's to be entertained. It's to be intellectually curious and to be intellectually humble and to, to listen to these incredible trip reports, these incredible anecdotal accounts that people have of both in hyperspace and there are some awesome research references to things that have happened outside of hyperspace that sound just like these things. And I think that during the research process, just conversing with David so closely about all the material he was going, combing through archivally, that it really reignited my interest in a lot of those kinds of phenomena, as well as mythological research, but how the mind takes these things that are seen as fairy tale land or, oh, the little kobolds, the little mind people, whatever, how that translates into a postmodern imagination. How do we get from like kobolds and German mythology as these little mind no guys to like all of a sudden they're these little blue guys and Whitley Strabers communion. That's weird. But I think that has a lot to do with the culture shapes, like how the brain changes its perception of the physiological, the neurological thing. I don't know. Given it some thought, I, I have to just entertain them that they might be real on some level. I can't write them off. I don't want to be like, oh yeah, they're real, but I can't write it off. And I've had so many weird hyperdimensional contacts with entities on other catalysts too as a psychonaut that I can't write off these different energy forms and that they seem to be um, autonomous and they, they react and there's abstract kinds of dialogue possible on, on some level. So it would be naive to just write it. Yeah, so I wanted to actually get into the taxonomy and mm -hmm. the different kinds of beings that you're talking about, but you actually gave me the, the, the prompt I wanted to start with, which is talking about the kobolds and their relationship to these beings that in current uh, UAP lore discourse are described as biomechanical. You know, that the whole, like in, in European mythology and the association of a certain class of entity as being mineral in nature associated like the the dwarves in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves working in a mine associated with gemstones this is something mm -hmm. that does also pop up elsewhere in the lore the traditions of various psychedelic medicine groups the shamanic initiation where your body is opened and then crystals are inserted in the experience of these people. And I, again and again in the UFO literature, Stuart Davis interviewed a number of people who had found on x-ray this question of the implant, the, this residual object, a, a seemingly bizarre technologies inserted without stitches in the human body. So that gets back to a couple things. One is the question of topology, right? If something can be placed into you, as is often the case, placed into or removed from you, as people frequently report, in particular in these mantid encounters and in other kinds of abduction and penetrative or surgical interactions. And then there is a motif throughout that particular corner of the lore that what we're interacting with, like you said, it's on a gradient, but that there's something about the insectoid and the mechanical that kind of blur into each other. And yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this in terms of, frankly, like when I had Adam Aronovich on the show in 211, and we were talking about the way that the popularization of the idea that we live in a simulation is leading to a, a particular form of psychopathology in which people regard everyone else as non-player characters. Rodney Asher's documentary, A Glitch in the Matrix, talks about that. And that Ian McGilchrist talks about how a, a 
imbalance favoring the left hemisphere and its instrumental and operational way of re relating to the world. Like Descartes was a, a fan of vivisection because he, he saw animals as not bearing souls and therefore not capable of actually suffering. And we are having these kinds of relationships, not all of us, but a substantial number of people are having these kinds of relationships where Western industrial society's own tendency to regard the, the living world as inanimate is being reflected back on us in these experiences where people who are perhaps a little bit more hemispherically balanced have very different kinds of experiences with very similar beings. Graham Hancock talks about encountering big-brained robots. So I'm curious about your thoughts since, again, AI has figured so heavily in this project. What pattern are you observing in the way that the machinic or the mechanical or the automatic are coming through, not just in these contemporary DMT experiences, but seem to be continuous at least centuries back into our folklore? I don't know. It may have finally gotten to the point where we can look at it through a lens cargo culting rather than looking at it through a lens of, oh, it's a fairy or, oh, it's a kobold or, oh, it's whatever. Now we're at this point where what is this phenomenon? So it's like we've shifted the lens through which we look at it. And it could be a genuine taxonomy. And I think that it's important to understand that whatever's going on has been going on for a really long time. And so I think about the idea that whatever's happening is indigenous to the planet. And so looking at it from this lens, oh, these little aliens, we're already embedded in whatever kind of ecology it is. And we're just like discovering that the edges of that ecology are bigger than we took for granted. And I think that the, in a way, there's the kind of people who feel like the machine takes the soul out of it. And there's the kind of people who see the machine as like a tool to help us organize and, and catalog and understand the picture going on. It's like the machine can't trip, but the more effectively I can communicate to it or utilize it for machine learning, brain data or whatever, like it helps me be a better researcher, understander of my own mind, or just like the human condition. Because that's ultimately like what we're trying to use these as tools to understand. If we have this expanded set of what the human condition can give us as conscious beings by tapping into these medicines, like what, what does that mean for the human experience? So many people outside the psychonautic community, they're like, Oh, you're ruining your brain. Why would you do that? And there's this very strange quality about, oh, you don't fuck with your mind. And I understand because like throughout human history, like you eat that raw mushroom, you might go absolutely insane. But now we're at this place where science and pharmacology have given us like these new lenses and it is forcing people to ask really heavy questions that I can tell a lot of people aren't ready for I look at folks who are in the sciences and straight up doing the research, but they're going in with their mind already made up. I probably know who I'm talking about, but so I'll just say for people who don't know, Zeus Tapato and his work in the Netherlands, he is of the opinion that they're not real and that it is just like drug stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe Zeus has like some other alien experience that's outside of DMT space. And maybe the machine will tell him someday that there's something more here than just form constant and consistency across multiple subjects based on that alone. Right. Well, I mean, and that gets to the question of the reproducibility problem. Like we've been dancing around this issue when I had Helena Wabe on a little while back from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and she brought up Jonathan Schooler's work at UC Santa Barbara. And you know, Schooler works on this problem of, oh my God, what's it called? D like the diminishment of 
uh, statistical significance and various scientific results of like p- years later, people go back and try to reproduce these experiments and like Prozac, Prozac doesn't pass the test anymore. Placebo outcompetes Prozac in clinical trials. So again, to this question of as has numerous people working in, in sci research have suggested that this work is actually not as objective as it might seem on first pass, because there is something about your expectations that can alter the outcomes of the actual study. That's going to be a problem forever in this field. That problem is never going to go away. And we have to be willing to do the experiments knowing that. Look at anthropology. You can't study a human culture without having some kind of effect on them, without having some kind of influence, or even just having your own observation be skewed by your own set. And you just have to get over that part of it. I think that's where the machine learning on the raw data is going to be interesting because everybody does have their own brain patterns. But looking at aggregates look cool and looking at ways of reconstructing the visual field will be really cool. The same way they're doing that with Facebook and just people's regular field of vision. I've been following that research since it was like back in the day in grainy videos with like Russian scientists and kids. (laughs) And they were like piping out what the cat was seeing in the lab. And then there would be the scientist's face and he would have his hair look like cat ears. So that cat is catamorphizing that scientist. So there's all these interesting subjective filtering quirks that happen. Even a, another biological set like a cat, they're looking at you like a cat all the time. And that would be a really interesting experiment to go down that rabbit hole and see how reproducible that is. But in that particular instance, it was completely undeniable. Right? Any human being looking at that data, that the, the cat was looking at the dude and making him a cat. And I wonder how much that bit bleeds back into what I was saying about our perceptions of these potential elf thingies, these other beings, but then also training machines on it, like what patterns or hallucinations the machine can see. But I, going back to the soullessness thing, and I'm completely biased because of the way my personal experience with psychedelics and being psychonaut has been. But yeah, there's a big, big hole in a lot of people's spirit in our society, in Western culture, and people blame a lot of different things for it. And I think that in trying to pull reality apart, trying to look for the why and the spark, we have really depersonalized the cis ourselves from the, the magic of life and the direct experience of it. And probably what makes a lot of psychedelic people very passionate is because they have such a close relationship with the sensation of awe. We're never going to pick apart the psychedelic experience and find an adequate explanation for what the awe is or what the divine spark is. I don't even know if we're going to get a decent idea of what does it mean to say who's there, like when it's on a different dimension and it's just in your head. That's mystic territory and science can't cope with that. So yeah, like maybe James Kent didn't just have some elf tell him something relevant, but what is an interpersonal insight not count? For all the people who like drank brew or whatever, I don't know. It's just how we qualify what's going to be valuable coming back from the experience. Yeah, I th- hearing you talk about this, it strikes me that the advantage that we have now, even though some of these problems are fundamental, is that we can do these large statistical correlations that we can start addressing the researcher and the context. Like when I think about at some point soon, I'm going to interview Pooja Olhaver for Humans on the Loop. And Pooja wrote this piece with Vitalik Buterin and Glenn Weil on non-transferable tokens on the blockchain. Because the Glenn and the Plurality Institute people are really interested in quadratic voting so you can decompose a vote so that even if there's a majority, you can identify how members of that majority might be in a homogeneous group. Like 51% of people saw this, but they all went to the same school. And so like the more carefully we can start to 
correlate findings, not just in a lump format, but correlate them to people with different kinds of life experience, people from different cultures, like a little like preliminary version of that is going on now, but it becomes really interesting if you can say, wow, like was some of the metastatistical stuff done around the Princeton engineering anomalies research work and other work on psi phenomena that there are strong correlations in otherwise statistically robust research between people who do believe that they're going to get an outcome and people who don't. Yeah. And so this, you get into this weird thing where it's on the one hand, we're never going to get rid of the bias. Like you're, hey, we I'm can too. learn to, we can learn to see our own bias. Yes. A little bit. We can learn to see it better. And so I have a good example of this. So I grew up <clears throat> really afraid of Stephen King's I saw it on daytime television when I was like five. It was the worst. And I was super afraid of it for years. I had nightmares. And I didn't like well. And the first time I smoked DMT in an effective dose, I saw these jeweled Harlequin jesters and they're like doing all these cool acrobatics and they've got their multiple arms and they're doing their fun thing. I was just enraptured. I loved it. I was like, they're beautiful. The circus thing going on is so cool. They weren't scary. They didn't give me a hard time. They were very jovial and like friendly. And I was blown away because it wasn't until after the fact that I realized I was like, those things were such clowns. And I realized that it like melted my fear of clowns and that I wasn't bothered by them anymore. And I liked the idea of dressing up as a clown or exploring clowning or whatever. And I, that was became a whole chapter of me cargo vaulting the DMTOs and whatever. But it was so crazy because I had read the up to the spirit molecule and seen lots of different tropes and stuff. But at the same time, I had no idea what I would see. And the last thing I thought I would see with clowns just because I had this like fear of them. And I would think hypothetically, if I were to see clowns, that they would be scary. Right. But the fact that they weren't and that it was healing and made such a strong aggression was very unexpected for me at the time because I had thought when you read DMT is feel real, I feel there are so many different beings that people encounter that after a certain point, you just throw this idea out the window that you're going to be hyper specifically influenced because there's old grandma ladies with blankets, like lifting the blankets and there's like glyphs and stuff from different reports. And I'm just like, okay, my brain is so saturated with different things. It's a roulette. There could be anything behind the wall. And for me, it just happened to be these these acrobatic Carl Quinn gesture things. But contextually, the novelty of them being completely removed from anything scary, even though that was like initially what my relationship to that archetype had been since childhood. But yeah, in the same way that for some folks, gestures are scary. And like the Joe Rogan story where they're like flipping people off and stuff. But yeah, I think that... They're about as real as dreams and dream work. And I think that learning to observe our own bias about being embodied, and this goes into some of the stuff I've done with biomorphic empathy, just like understanding our set as these bipedal primates and how much we project our morphology onto the other when we go to those places. Because there's no way they're really humanoid in hyperspace. But yeah, to me, I don't, I, if they solve the mystery someday, I would totally read that paper. But until they figure it out, I'm totally satisfied with it being just like an interesting, open-ended adventure. I want to embellish with you the, a point that you were just making about anatomy as, or like the way I learned to talk about it at, at SFI was anatomy as a, an encoding of the stable features of an environment. The, the body is hypothesis. Or again, Alato McDowell talks about this. Let's see. Oh, it's a beautiful passage on visiting Big Sur. And they write, we watched an elephant seal arch its back in an S shape and bask on the rocks in the sun. We talked about the intelligence embedded in all of this. When I look at an animal, that's what I see. Intelligence about a biome compressed and extracted by evolution into a living form. It takes millions of years for life to coalesce from space in this way. 
which is why it's so tragic that species are lost, that using a term from machine learning here, that the latent space of ecological knowledge is degraded this way. Yeah. For me, the like where this gets really kooky and interesting is Stuart Davis and many others report being shown in their encounters that these beings do not perceive time in the same way as human beings conventionally do, according to our current cultural frame, that it's more like the models of time that are disclosed by physics, convoluted manifolds of informational interaction, or or in Robin Sloan's Moonbound, talking about like tangled and woven time. And so what does it mean for evolution to operate and to bind and to fix features in form when we're not talking about the linear unfolding of a process of encoding? That's the thing I find myself bashing my head on over and over. And I wonder what you think about that. What that we like, what that there's this weird back door to access that other stuff even exists or like the, these beings show up in a particular way that does seem contingent on us, but like, yeah, to the degree that they are independent or to the degree that they at least transcend the initial conditions of one particular person and their experience of them, then there are consistencies and But in what way are these consistencies, what does evolution look if it's not unfolding over linear time? Are we um, we talking about, we we must be talking about a trans-temporal. Oh yeah, vitamin D regulates the encoding of 400 genes. There's lots of things multitasking, even in this seemingly limited dimensional constructs. We look at things and we're like, meat space, but meat space is really complicated and super spectacular and very fucking hyperdimensional. And so when I'm like, we just realize that giant DNA is not junk. So when I think about like the linear thing about evolution, I can't help but think about how stable the mechanism of RNA transcript is. That's lasted longer than any geological formation on the planet. And so it is operating on a completely different time frame. The changes are nothing. That's just like shimmying through little circumstances through time, but it's a deep time creature. So there could be all kinds of little Easter eggs just in the fact that a species has gotten to this point of being able to conceptualize. Like... Human beings have already been so complicated that we knew that we were unique and something weird was going on. And that's been the case for a really long time. And we know we're different. And granted, there is no other. We are a natural part of that process. David and I have talked about this illusory division between what is natural and what is artificial. And like a human being will say that because it was here before us versus what have we augmented. But... If you just look at it as this boundaryless expression of consciousness, we've gone to a place where just intrinsically the fact that we're looking, that we have the AI and it's about to have crazy mathematic access to equation computation that we can't even understand the answers to in tandem with this, it also makes me chapel peerless think about it like Robert E. Tillerson saying like humanity is in this crazy crisis right now and the bottom is falling out of everything but we're like right around the corner from these absolutely insane understandings that will just completely transform and shatter society if we survive it but I feel like that in and of itself is a linear process just by virtue of psychedelics and dreams and human experience being non-linear I know we take it for granted and because that's the thing that we have cohesion and structure society on and have consensus reality. But these other things shatter that consensus reality and create a new consensus that we'll have been abducted by aliens and mantises where they have seen elves and the triple walls or that the singularity might be intrinsically 
into the psychedelic. So to that point, nod again to Terrence McKenna and the strange attractor at the end of time. And this question of, is it really at the end of the linear unfolding of time, or is it a hyperspatial object that we perceive as before us in time because we're perceiving time as a low dimensional projection. And so it's something that is always there. That's something that even before I started Future Fossils, I did an interview with William Irwin Thompson back in 2011, talking about the difference between prophecy and prediction. And his point was that a lot of people try to collapse the Akash or whatever. They have these revelatory experiences and then they try to squeeze them into the dimensionality that we have, which results in an experience of time somewhat geocentrism. But in our yeah. temporal understanding, we look and we see the sun moving like this over the horizon and back down, but these experiences can decenter us. And for those of you listening who are not watching, you've got the tattoo of the heptapod glyph from yeah. Arrival. Yeah, it's a yeah. little cat. I oh, it nice. But it turned it like into a Yeah, it's also like the little like the brush stroke thing from um, philosophy. Yeah, if my experience is that it makes me think that aspects of us things just outside of our what we traditionally understand how it flows has. That's definitely what that tattoo is about on some levels. I think that there's a, like a dimensional inheritance or richness that we're about to tap into. That movie in particular was really moving. That's one of the reasons why I, I really don't like pop culture iconography stuff for tattoos, but I think this is like one of the only sort of odes to some kind of like modern movie or cinema or pop culture thing that I have. But based on this, it's the story of your life. It's a great collection of short stories. And the story of your life is pretty short. It's not a novella or anything, but it's so potent. And I think that it is a great narrative example of somebody tapping into a higher dimensional understanding of time and how confusing that is at first, like remembering things that haven't happened yet or speaking to the collapsing thing where people want to collapse potentialities. That's what all of this reality is just a competition who's going to collapse the most of their vision more. That's what the esoteric magical thing about it is, right? It's, that's like the exponent of power. How much of your will can you collapse in this tiny time frame or whatever? And so is we're dealing like, with... Is that like how many externalities does your revenue model leave out? That's what, what's like profit is just like what you don't have to pay for. Yeah, it's the little underpants gnomes in South Park. And the how there's just the mysterious step two. And no one really knows what it is, but that's the stuff they want you to not regularly. But yeah, I just think that the times that we're in are so crazy. Just yesterday, I think I was watching uh, Lex Friedman chat with Elon and the whole Neuralink and the ways that they were talking about being able to actually capture signal and what was going to be the realistic information feedback lead for the BCI. Like, why can't it be non-invasive? Just all these questions. I, I think that there's a reason why psychedelic people will have an intellectual premium when it comes to how to navigate communicating with, even if we just call it pseudo-consciousness, the machine consciousness, and the nature of the interface with an AI assistant that's in your head. Come on, that's pretty weird. And it might have a lot of interesting correlations with how people cope with when they trip balls and then there's somebody else in their head <laughs> for five or 10 minutes. DMT experience. Yeah, it's like in the process of creating over 4,000 images with Midjourney in the past two years. And then about maybe 3,000 of those images being specifically for the book and then combing through those to find the ones that best represent this collective consciousness on all the trip reports that people have shared, but also have something that, that looks good, that's compelling, that has that human spirit, that has the human curation and the overpainting and the love put into it. 
so that it does just become more than just like the AI, just roulette machine, right? But there, there's that same kind of neural network that gets set up for me to have this weird meta conversation. I think about how am I going to potentially transpose that? I personally don't want the PCI brain, but it makes me think about those future kinds of skill sets and conversations and even like hypothetical interface dynamics, the AI and BCI. Yeah, actually, the first time I had you on the show was episode 29. And what we talked about then, I think, was hugely formative to where I I feel a, a moral imperative to work these days. It's really blossomed, this question of raising robots right? You know, yeah, the yeah. title of that conversation. And what you're talking about now, the issue of curation, which Brian identified as the dominant art form of the 21st century and life online. And this question of attention, Alan Bediner edited that book, Zigzag Zen, about psychedelics and Zen Buddhism, and points to the relationship between the DMT experience and the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was like also the psychedelic experience. Yeah. Leary and Alpert got there first. And this question of the allocation of attention, because if we're looking, one of the one of the the big bow on top topics that we could end with is, okay, what we have here in your book is the arguably like a map of a an unyielding both and cosmos. It's every possible hypothesis, every possible biological form or tr post-biological form seems represented in this corpus. And likewise, when we're talking about latent space and the question of, are we creating or discovering? What we're talking about is ultimately a question of how to engage with something that is so much vastly bigger than our ability to attend to it, to squeeze it into narratives. And like, yeah. like this whole question you were saying about, about magical will, which is cr central to humans on the loop. And I would love to get you in on that at some point as a co-host, ask this kind of like esoteric question about technology and our relationship to it a little bit beyond the scope of propping up this particular book. But I would still love to hear your thoughts on navigating latent space under the conditions of fundamental uncertainty, right? It gets to that same question about like, yeah. how do we even know what we're looking at if it falls outside of our training data? You just gotta get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It sucks. Like I come from like a Gnostic philosophical background and that can be seen from a fairly dark lens or it could be seen from a fairly liberating lens. And I've fluctuated over the years, but just having that background where I'm willing to ask hard questions about things that in modern wrappers and window dressings looks like simulation theory, right? And this uncertainty about reality, this lack of consensus reality, I think that you just have to like learn to be comfortable with being comfortable. Sometimes that means disengaging from the space on some levels. To be honest, I haven't imbibed in a while. In a while, I had some really weird experiences and that says a lot. Granted, it probably sound pretty banal to the average person, but I think that the, just the level of detail and the, it's one of those moments where you think that you've broken through for 10, 15 years and then you have this new level of breakthrough where you're actually on a planet and these silhouetted beings that were just completely dark, silhouetted beings, like fill up to me. And I'm like, this isn't a gesture. This isn't an elf. This isn't a whatever. It's, it has a cloak on. I don't mean a fabric cloak. I'm talking about a technological cloaking mechanism that made them completely absorb light. And so I could not see who or what they were. Okay. And then they show me this diagnostic thing. And it's this like 
12D crazy purple and black cube. And they're like, can you see the math in it? And it's folding in on itself. And I'm mesmerized. But yes, I can see the mathematics that are in this QB. And it's a brain diagnostic tool. Okay. And then in comes this female-ish neurosurgeon who then proceeds to poke around my brain like it's Japan. And I'm experiencing this like binaural flashing black and white light inside my head. See it. And so pedestrians, but all on the surface, right? was not terribly exotic seeming compared to other people's stories of maybe like space fantasies and stuff. But the level of the hyperreality was so far beyond anything in like Fractally, Alice in Grey, Glyphland, or any of it. To the point where it made that space seem like noise, right? And so simultaneously... The crazy, fantastic experience I had maybe about three or four years ago at this point, which was my last ride for a while. So I haven't talked to the elves about what they think about AI. I haven't talked to the elves about what they think about the book. I'm scared of that. But the uh, absolute reverence for the space is really friggin' important because it is the mystery. And I had to sit with a deep discomfort about my experience because it was so reality shattering because it was so vivid. And in the end, it was still euphoric. It was still beautiful. It was still visionary. And there wasn't anything bad about it. But even the most starchy of us can still have our ass handed to us because the rabbit hole is that deep. And so there's never a point where people are going to just be like, yeah, I'm comfortable with the mystery. I'll then go in deep enough. But no, I think it's about to have a huge jackpot in terms of the tools that we have now that we can use in space where we've only been able to leverage our own brain. And you're talking about attention. I think that Elon brought something up really weird in his interview that I hadn't considered before because I hadn't put this premium on uh, linear computation for an AI. Are they going to get bored with us and just not want to bother with the energy expenditure to wait for us to make a couple calculations and then share it with them. And that was the initial sort of inspiration behind him wanting to do Neuralink so that there would be like that better dovetailing in the symbiosis of like human consciousness and the AI. But yeah, like I sometimes think about what is the attention investment of the hypothetical potential other as well. Like how do they see us in these spaces? And like just like this weird flatland compressed little shape that they come across. And they're like, oh, here's that little squiggle. Let's have a novel conversation with him. Blow its mind. Yeah, just like being grateful. That's even possible. That's how I like get jaded and am willing to sit with the discomfort of all the like ontological mystery of it. So actually you gave me the, you might have already answered this, but it, just as a way of doubling down on this particular characteristic of the phenomenon as broadly described, what is it about, like you just mentioned this in your own experience. Certainly I've had this experience years past. What is it about the consistent demand for attention that so many of these beings, regardless of their specific type, seem to place on us? No, so, like, yeah. Because yeah. admittedly, part of the reason I have not gone neck deep in DMT in a long time is because of working in social media and being basically irradiated inside the nuclear reactor of the attention economy and developing a really horrific perspective on the way that we exploit one another's attention and the way that the systems that we've created, the institutions we've created, exploit one another's attention. And the tea fairy talks about this. The tea fairy says, be really careful to whom, which of these entities you actually honor with your attention. Yeah, I was definitely spooked out doing a lot of the entries and I want to honor other people's experiences. I don't want to deny their realities. And so it's important to taxonomy them these entities, these demons and stuff that happen for some people or the reptilians or all the unpleasant ones to not let our bias get in the way there, but also not really give them 
that energetic power in the sense that some of these things are, if we were to entertain them, they are like gin or archons or energetic parasites and things that you want to have a good sort of spiritual immune system, but you don't also want to feed the bogey. But yeah, the, also just this idea of the human being spreading the mushroom for it. Terrence was talking about in that same way that like maybe we're colonizing hyperspace with our attention and our interactions with these banks. But there's also that awesome sense of urgency that they come at you with. Sometimes I don't think the awe is necessarily distracting as it is. Wow, this is really important and cool. We only have you on the phone for a little while. So if you could really pay attention, that would be dope. And that's the, the philosophy I come to it with. I'm on pretty good terms. I thought a couple elves be cheeky and, and mean or try to like give you that ego check or a little hyper slap. But I think that just good interpersonal maintenance of like your psyche just gives you the fortitude to do the work, but also not get swamped by it, but also that self-trust to know when maybe it's time to chill out. Because that's just a pattern in long-term trippers in general is that sometimes you put the phone down. Sometimes you realize that there might be more message that you want to pick up. So I feel like this was my way of honoring all my years of experience with it and how fascinating it was. And I see that as like something obviously interwoven with, but also decidedly separate from my actual practice as a site. Like I could keep making art about trips until I'm a cute little old crone lady, but just the magic and novelty of it doesn't really wear off even in memory retrospect. To me, they're all artifacts. So it's art, but it's also catalog. I think that it's going to be really monumental for people to have that shared archetypal map. Because then like, they could say, I saw this, but it was different. And this is how it was different. Because that's just as important as people saying, oh, I have an affinity with this. And plus, there's just so much AI art that like, this is a drop in the bucket of how like this renaissance of accessibility for people to describe their trips. And I think that's like the the main thematic or motif behind the book is that we really wanted to just create something that was like a tool or a codex for people to reflect on their own experiences, but then also add to the tapestry. So bonus round, final question, because <laughs> you just stimulated this in me would be, okay, you and I both sit on the advisory board of Noonautics, right? Along with Dennis McKenna and Andrew Gallimore and lots of wonderful people. We have this opportunity to nudge the next layer of research in this domain. And just off the cuff now, I'm curious, because I haven't actually asked you this, if you were to try and moonshot one revolutionary advancement. We talked about the brain to video stuff. You just mentioned the open science protocol of everyone being able to contribute to an enormous database. If we can start using tools like this to answer a question, what question do you want to aim for? That's tough because so much of the answer is the question the most Miss America stupid answer. It would just be like, how do human beings maintain their drive for progress and excellence and bettering our quality of life that we get over our fear and our greed and our insane exploitation of resources? Because I know that there's so much controversy over applications of technology and the harm it's done to the planet. I've done a lot of personal research into plastics and environmental sciences and things like that. But I really see AI as a way to potentially find solutions for a lot of the problems that we've created and systems that it'll be very difficult for human intellects to understand like how to help remediate that image. But we have to be spiritually at peace to be motivated to use those technologies to fix the problem. So you can have the answer right in front of you. We have so much knowledge, we have so many solutions, but there's this weird friction where we're not 
able to redirect the energy necessary in people's attention. It comes back to attention. For me personally, my interest in VR is because it helps us prototype reality. The same way that novel psychedelic experiences can help us understand, like Carrie Mullis and Glimmery's chain reaction. So I think I would ask, how the fuck does humanity get over themselves so they don't destroy themselves? That's the easiest way. And that's why I like psychedelics. It's very humbling and it shows you how big the universe is. But yeah, so I just make pretty pictures and hope that maybe I can inspire people to contribute to that bigger tapestry of how we answer that question. How do we like enjoy this beautiful magic ride, but also get over ourselves? Thanks, brother. This is fun. Super duper. Yeah, I appreciate all the work you've done over the years. And I'm so grateful that your beautiful art is a part of our book. Because there are really so many other artists. Like I know that we're talking about like me and David, but this book is a tapestry of so many other people's hard work over the years. And I know that it's going to just blow people's minds. We put so much love and hard work into it. Yourself included. Thank you yeah, for... No, let it not be... Infinite. Let it not go and say that you're <laughs> the curation. It feels like I have cool privilege. friends. <laughs> I was able yeah. to bring in some really cool yeah, friends. Yeah, like all it. the yeah. homies are in this book. That feels really good. It feels this is going to end up in the Library of Alexandria or something. Yeah, it's like a, it's a cult classic for the psychedelic scene for sure. So you really did one waving so many people in through the door. I've been I've been secretly collecting all these lovely artists in my, my mind for years just as to me, they're historical figures. And it, David and I were just really blessed that inner traditions felt that this was important and they wanted it to become a reality. It, it's really a dream that's over 10 years in the making. So, hell yeah. Rock on. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Highly recommended that you stay tuned with Sarah Finn on social media for updates about the release of the Field Guide to DMT Entities, as well as her myriad other creative projects. And of course, that you dial in with me here on this feed for upcoming episodes with Jamie Curcio, Eric Wargo, JF Martel, and others before the December rebrand. We're hosting conversations on the regular in the Future Fossils Facebook group and Discord server. And I will be announcing December live calls very, very soon. Take care and have a wonderful week.